Thank you so very much. So good to be back in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, to be introduced by Dolly Parton's husband, Carl Dean. And uh, <laughs> it's good that her husband has time to serve as mayor. I would think that <laughs> being married to Dolly would be a full-time thing. And so good to, um, to uh, have, this, have this bookstore and Patchett's uh, bookstore. We were worried about you when Davis Kidd closed, and um, now you have another independent bookstore, Ann Patchett and, uh, and uh, Louise Erdrich and uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti and I'm sure others, authors getting into the, into the bookselling business over the advice of their accountants. Uh, <laughs> Sort of like, uh, I don't know, sort of like farmers uh, buying yogurt factories or something. <laughs> but uh, good for them. I'm in the um, book business myself back in St. Paul, Minnesota. And that's one good reason to, to publish a book is so that one can support one's bookstore <laughs> and, uh, and keep it going. This is a collection of, um, of, of poems, verse, um, that I've uh, written over the years, mostly for a Prairie Home Companion. Um, doing a variety show, you do want to have some variety, and, uh, and it's nice to, you know, to swerve out of, out of uh, stories and, and out of music and into into rhymed metrical uh, speech, and um, and even even if it's something as simple as uh, there was a, rep a a Republican lady of Knoxville uh, bought her brassieres by the boxful, <laughs> which she stuffed with corn kernels and old Wall Street journals to keep the fronts of her frocks full. Uh, <laughs> it's nothing, and uh, it's just a you know. It's, Passing out candy at the at the at at, at the uh, the school, a vegan with nothing to do picked up a sandwich to chew. He took a big bite and cried out in fright, "O M G W T F B B Q." <laughs> the. Um, the limerick observes a very strict form, and so to, to write one properly is, is like solving a puzzle, um, but, a, but a puzzle without squares. Uh, but but it, has to, it has to be in the meter, and it's best if the joke come in the last line and not be, and not be given away, as, as, in that, uh, as in that joke right there. I used to do avant-garde dance with a blowtorch, blue paint, and no pants, <laughs> which some people guessed was genius, and the rest left quickly when given the chance. <laughs> not bad, not bad, but not as good as OMG WTF BBQ. People just don't expect to hear WTF on public radio. And, uh, <laughs> and so you have the element of surprise there. I set out, uh, when I was your age, I set out to be a serious uh, writer, of course, uh, because, because, because serious writers were the ones who were, who were held up for esteem by our English teachers, and all writers start out trying to please their English teachers. Some keep trying long after the English teachers have died. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I failed uh, to, 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 to go down that road. And the advantage of getting to this advanced age at which I am uh, is that you can look back and you can see how things happened to you. Uh, you can look back at your, at your troubled adolescence. All of us were troubled. Uh, and, 
and you can and you can see how you were hoping to to be a serious artist, which you believed required that you be haunted and 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 deeply troubled. Uh, uh, with some 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 terrible wound that you suffered in your in 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 your childhood, I imagined when I was your age that I would that I would die young, like Buddy Holly, like 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 James Dean, like Janis Joplin, and thereby become immortal, as all of them did. They still sell posters. Of James Dean, he hasn't made a movie in what sixty years. <laughs> they still sell postcards. He still he still is 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 an idol. I imagined that I would die young, and that and that people would come and and lay bouquets on my grave and and mourn me. What a shame, you know, that he that he never had the chance to realize his tremendous talent. Um, which seemed noble uh, to me. Well, it didn't happen, obviously. Uh, <laughs> it didn't happen, uh, for one thing, because uh, there was never a need for me to charter a small plane in a snowstorm. <laughs> and, uh, and I never could afford a Porsche. like. Like James Dean had, and I, heroin was hard to get hold of in <laughs> Lake Wobegon, and uh, but more than that, I wasn't, I wasn't sure that I actually had the talent. You see, I, I, I was full of, full of doubt about that. Other people thought I was talented artistically because I was. Uh, very quiet and standoffish, and uh, I never made eye contact, um, and so they assumed that I had some gift. Uh, <laughs> nowadays, they would say high-functioning end of the autistic spectrum, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, but back then, uh, back then they interpreted oddness in a different way. You see, as 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 being as being somehow positive. I went off to the University of Minnesota uh, with with clear intentions of becoming a serious a serious poet. But as I look back, the serious poems of my time were not what I really liked. I simply felt an obligation as an English major to write essays about how great they were. You see, the, the, the obligation that a student has to his teachers to follow, follow down the correct path. But in my heart, I didn't, I didn't care for um, Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. Why would somebody stand and watch snowfall? <laughs> What's the point? In Minnesota, I mean... <laughs> and then the heroic last lines that were quoted by generations of, of, of politicians. Uh, the woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. Well, yes, get moving, right. <laughs> what were you doing stopped here in the first place? I didn't care for it as much as, as I cared for, um, for uh, birds do it and bees do it. Even people with bad knees do it. <laughs> let's do it, let's fall in love. I, or, or t'was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. She, 
I was a child and she was a child in the kingdom by the sea, but we loved with a love that was more than love. I and my Annabel Lee, a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. This was memorable. And memorability, is there such a word? I guess. Uh, <laughs> memorability, it seems to me, is a mark of art. Norman Rockwell, the painter, so scorned by the academic art world and the New York art world of the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, nonetheless created indelible images that people remember all these years later. Shakespeare, who was scorned by many serious poets because he was entertaining the masses at the Globe Theater, nonetheless gave us these, all these lines that have become part of our, part of our language and, and poems that once you memorize them, you will know them forever. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and think upon myself and curse my fate is something that you will always remember. To me, this is the mark of, of something. I went off to the university um, with the idea of becoming a serious poet, and there our serious poet was John Berryman, who was the author of the Dream Songs, uh, which uh, was very famous uh, back when I was in college. John Berryman, who had, uh, who had suffered terrible losses uh, as a child, and, uh, and his poetry in many ways stemmed, stemmed from these losses. John Berryman, who, who waged a lifelong struggle against mental illness and alcoholism, and his readings were memorable, much more so than the poems themselves. He would lean against the podium. He leaned against it like you would lean on a lifeboat. This was he needed it for support. He was three sheets to the wind. And he stood and he chain smoked as he, as he read. And his voice was, was so slurred you could hardly understand him. And there he was, a picture, of, a picture of a man in serious distress. And to me, a student, it seemed as if his distressed, his, his disability and his talent were all tied up together, you see. And that's how I took it back then, that you couldn't have one without the other, you see. His father had killed himself, had shot himself um, on, on, in, in the yard outside the boy's uh, bedroom when the boy was 12, uh, whereupon his mother went off and married the man uh, she had been sleeping with, uh, an adulterous uh, relationship that was one of the factors in the father's suicide. This is a serious wound to suffer when you are 12 years old. What did I suffer? Nothing compared to that. I mean, my dad made me hoe half an acre of corn and tomatoes. What's that? <laughs> My people were, were sanctified brethren. They, they, were, they were fundamentalists, and they had, and they had, uh, they had apocalyptic visions of the end of all things, but they were rather cheerful people, actually. <laughs> Because we assumed that we were of the remnant, you know, that would be, that would be redeemed, even, even as the rest of you, you know, would <laughs> go sliding into perdition. <laughs> so I fell into writing what's called light verse, verse meant to amuse. Because I do come from cheerful people, and I believe in cheerfulness. 
I believe in it as, as a choice that a person makes. And that's not to say that illness is to be dismissed, depression and all the rest, not at all. But even crazy people can be cheerful, and I've known a number of them. I may be one of them myself. His wife said, please be careful, and he smiled patiently. I know what I'm doing. Don't worry about me. So he buckled right in with a confident grin, and his screwdriver touched a live wire, and he let out a cry and proceeded to die in a shower of sparks and fire. And the people who gave the eulogies spoke of honor and love and ambition. They spoke well of the dead, and nobody said, why didn't he call an electrician? <laughs> well, now, you see, this is a poem that was written about somebody I went to high school with. He, uh, he, just, uh, he was a very bright guy, and uh, he played tight end on our football team. And uh, he uh, went off to the university when I was there, and he graduated from medical school. And he was just on the verge of going into uh, practice, and uh, his best earning years lay ahead of him. And then he decided that he could repair the water pump in his basement. The combination of water and electricity <laughs> would scare the bejesus out of me but not Bob. So that's the odd thing about that poem, which if I told you at the beginning it was true, you wouldn't have enjoyed it as much. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Epithalamian. Epithalamian. I believe that's the title of a poem by Keats, John Keats, Epithalamian. After she took a pith, I happily lay me on her, and there with her, all restraint gone, we got excited, we passionate too, oh, we united, e pluribus duo, between the sheets, belly to belly, the envy of Keats and also of Shelley. <laughs> the 17 year cicada crawls out of the ground and looks around from a wall or low-hanging limb. He looks for her and she discovers him. Courtship does not extend for months. Their only job is to have sex once. No long interlude of pleasant reminiscing about days gone by. Just buzz and whir and thank you, sir, and then you die. <laughs> Cicada love does not involve poetry or song. Was it good for you? Thanks. So long. <laughs> the old subject serves so well. Is there room for yet one more poem about love? Yes. Yes, there is room for another hundred thousand of them. And then we'll see. Doctor, doctor, I am ill. First I'm hot and then I'm chilled. Heart is pounding like a pump. Little noises make me jump. Doctor smiled and shook his head and said, for this there is no cure. You're a goner, that's for sure. Nothing helps that I know of. You're in love. I went to a gospel preacher. He said, oh, you sinful creature, kneel down and repent right here in my gospel tent. But a painted lady in a Cadillac was waiting for him out the back. Preacher, preacher, not you too. Yes, he said, what can I do? I cut a hole in the ice and I walked around it twice. Finally, I jumped in to cleanse myself of carnal sin. And a woman with no clothes slowly from the water rose, shimmying her narrow hips and kissed me on the lips. I guess that's the chance you take jumping in a lake. <laughs> Love is the universal sport. The night is dark and life is short. The heart is open, always willing. The touch of skin 
is so fulfilling. Darling, when I look at you, there is not much I can do. Touch is push, and push is shove. I'm in love. I wrote this poem for uh, my my wife um, when she was um, pregnant with our little girl. She had a miserable uh, pregnancy. We were living in New York at the time. And um, one thing I didn't get into the poem um, because I didn't think, I thought people would take it as exaggeration, was a, was a mid-pregnancy compulsion on her part to inhale bus exhaust. <laughs> so as we'd walk down Broadway on the Upper West Side, she would see a bus pull away from the curb and she would lean over and she would sometimes walk behind it a little ways. Sometimes the truth is too strange. <laughs> First trimester. I feel sick, nauseous, sweaty, lumpy, queasy. Others laugh. I'm uneasy. Had a big lunch. I'm about to lose. I've got the first trimester blues. People stare at the little bulge I know and think, my, my, she's let herself go. I ought to be overjoyed with elation. I'm thinking about hemorrhoids and constipation. <laughs> And I'm so tired, I can barely hold a teacup. And I'm thinking, yep, I'm about to throw up. <laughs> Word hormones flood my brain. I laugh, I cry, I feel insane. Men stare at me. I say, hi, mister, I'm not crazy. I'm in my first trimester. <laughs> no pale blush of motherhood, no bloom. My little belly has become someone's room. I feel fat, and I used to be elegant slim. My husband says I'm beautiful. Screw him. <laughs> this is something you can do if you, are, if you are a poet who is out to amuse. You can, you can write poems for people you know. There's no gift quite like it, and they don't have to be all that good either. Uh, if you take the right uh, attitude, if you write songs of praise for people. This one is for my daughter. I wrote this for her 12th birthday. And, uh, and she liked it a lot. Um, Life is like a circus parade, marching along as the calliopes played. There you are, young and elegant, up on the back of the lead elephant in your glittery costume, and I'm the guy with the shovel and broom. <laughs> My assignment is to scoop up the piles of elephant poop. You, my love, are youth and beauty. I'm on sanitation duty. <laughs> A slight demotion, yes, I know, but I'm still with the show enjoying the hullabaloo, and the health benefits are okay too. Same as if I were a star, so there you are. <laughs> this written for her just last year, she's 15. To people raised in a railroad shack, it is known as your butt crack. <laughs> to people who are more verbally deft, it is known as the gluteal cleft. Either way, it's at the bottom of your back between the one on the right and the one on the left. <laughs> Some lady's swimwear of slender heft displays freely the gluteal cleft. On this matter, my mind is shut. Don't go around showing off your butt. <laughs> Please desist at least until I am deceased. <laughs> your gluteal cleft, I must insist, should be seen by your dermatologist when treating a rash or cyst and nobody else. No daughter of mine wears thongs. That's the bottom line. <laughs> Why is it that in Rossini and Verdi, entertainment is such a rarity? 
Verdi's Aida goes on for hours. You need a double margarita and two whiskey sours <laughs> and a double martini for Puccini. Rigoletto, by the time it's through and Gilles is in the bag, I wish I were too. <laughs> Don Pasquale is not so jolly. Strauss's Ariadne is pure monotony. I sat and yawned through Peleus and Melisande, and Benjamin Britten wrote the most boring music ever written. And Mussorgsky was modest, of course, because his operas were not good enough, so they bore us. <laughs> the ring of the Nibelungs with all of those goddesses, the braids and the bodices, if they had more feeble lungs, Brunhilde and her crowd wouldn't sing so loud like someone's been flogging her, someone like Wagner. <laughs> when Mozart was three, he began to play the clavier. When he was five, he began to compose. When he was 10, already launched on his career, he began to worry about his hair and clothes. Am I cool, he wondered. Is this the wig I should be wearing, or should I have gotten the brunette? Are these knee breeches baggy? Why is everyone staring? I wonder if they'll like my new quartet. Even a genius is full of doubts about his looks and the future and melody and rhythm. And though the audience stands and claps and shouts, bravo, he wonders if anyone would like to go have a drink with him. He and his wife, Constanza, were not so astute when it came to money. No, not them. So after he'd finished writing the magic flute, he had to get busy on the requiem. He had to pay for their extravagances. So his work was never done, serenades and German dances and the piano concerto number 21 to pay for clothes and wine and gelati and the expense of yet one more infanty composed the Exultate Jubilate and the Jupiter Symphony. Had he and Mrs. Mozart avoided going in debt and been cautious and frugal, he might have written one small motet and maybe a concerto for bugle. Thank you, Mozart, for being so prolific and by the way, your hair looks terrific. <laughs> so this is what I do now. Instead of pretending that my father killed himself when I was 12, instead of pretending that I led an agonized uh, childhood, um, I respect those who do, and I did not, so thank you. <laughs> and onward we go with this little game of making, of making odd stories with little interesting, interesting rhymes. A poet is proud, a poet in my line of work is proud of these original rhymes that he, that he, Comes, comes up with. Back in the day, there were no cell phones. When a man left home, he was left alone. A man didn't always feel so connected. He didn't get a call from someone in Schenectady. This is enough to make your day. Not yours, but mine, you know. <laughs> Billy the Kid didn't do half of what they said he did. He rustled cattle, I guess it's true, but bad men was who they belonged to. He killed some guys, but if you knew them, you would say they had it coming to them. Billy the Kid went on the run down to Mozilla in 1881. Sheriff Pat Garrett put on the heat and came to the ranch of Billy's friend Pete. But it wasn't Billy who was shot by Pat. It was someone wearing his boots and hat. Billy the Kid was miles away in Santa Fe with flowers in his hair. I know because I was there. He made a fortune in fermented juices and built a mansion in Las Cruces, changed his name to William Bonney, wrote way down upon the Swanee. 
And he may have been guilty to a degree, but he was always good to me and generous to my family. Always sent us a Christmas turkey from Albuquerque, chocolate candy from the Rio Grande, and an embroidered pillow from Amarillo. I spoke at his funeral long ago. He was living in San Luis Obispo, big house on the beach. I gave a nice speech. People were impressed. They didn't know he was the most feared outlaw in the West, famous from Las Vegas to Reno. They knew him as Rudolph Valentino. <laughs> was Ethel Merman a Mormon? And how about Jesse Norman, General Sherman or Uma Thurman, Mormon or German? <laughs> In an enormous auditorium, the former Mormons stood performing stormy weather as warmly as they could. I'm not a Mormon, nor are you. Neither was Harmon Killebrew. The little mermaid used to be. She murmured Mormon once to me. There was a New York doorman and a dorm of sophomore men who adored Marilyn Monroe. Was she a Mormon? I don't know. Are former Ermine Farmers Mormon, Gorma Kaukonen, Norman Mailer, or Popeye the Sailor, Pee Wee Herman, or Norma Shearer? Was there a Mormon in their mirror? The risk looking for a rhyme for mirror and coming up with Norma Scherer <laughs> is that nobody knows who Norma Scherer was except for a few students of the old silent movies. But this is just the risk you have to run. Ode to the women on the mural at the State Theater, Hennepin Avenue, Minneapolis. Beautiful mural. You can't see it when you're on stage. And I've been on stage at the uh, state many times. In fact, I'm going to be on stage there on Saturday doing a Prairie Home Companion. And um, it wasn't until I went to a dance performance at the state that finally I got to see what was right up above the stage. And then I remembered all those times doing my show at the State Theater when people didn't seem to be looking straight at me. They seemed to be looking up. I thought it was a mood of adoration. <laughs> and it was, but not of me. <laughs> Dear naked ladies up in the air, naked girls of the murals, I love your hair. Here it's November, the season of flu, Weather is cold and drear. Nobody's naked here except for you. Had a good summer, though it was dry. I felt mortality reach out for me, time flying by. I go to work at eight, try to write prose. Some mornings it's good, some I wish we could take off our clothes. Dear naked ladies, your naked form, your physiognomies, Withstand the winter freeze, keep us all warm. Dear naked ladies, up in the air, ladies of my delight, hope to rise up some night and meet you there. Human sperm is very small, five microns, that's about all. It's just a cell with a dangly tail. Not as big as the ovum, and yet you have to love them, and they're produced in the testes of the male. Beneath their shiny domes, they contain your chromosomes, and the tail can kick just like a leg. Nothing could be finer than to swim up a vagina <laughs> in search of a rendezvous with an egg. The sperm has one ambition, and that's to gain admission to the female reproductive canal. And once he gets in it, he goes a millimeter a minute, along with 40 million of his pals. <laughs> the sperm is no boob when he smells the fallopian tube. He goes into some crazy figure eights about 10,000 times as those female enzymes keep egging him on to penetrate. The sperm all advance, and they do their little dance, but only one gets through the egg membrane. And the union of those two 
That's what led to you. So be grateful that your dad did not abstain. <laughs> that old man in the garage once let loose a great barrage. And though he is now ancient and infirm, and his breath is bad, children, he's your dad because he contributed his sperm. You can get them from a bank or from Jim or John or Frank, but when it comes to fatherhood, there's just one man to thank. He was young and he was dumb, but when things began to hum, he did not withdraw. He became your pa, and that is where we all came from. Aha, huh. now I know the sort of poem that you really like. <laughs> Not all that wordplay. Poems that get down to it. <laughs> oh, what a luxury it be, what pleasure, oh, what perfect bliss, how ordinary and yet chic to pee, to piss, to take a leak. To feel your bladder just go free and open like the mighty miss, and all your cares go down the creek to pee, to piss, to take a leak. For gentlemen of great physique who can hold water for one week. For ladies who one quarter cup of tea can fill completely up. For folks in urinalysis, for little kids just learning this. For Viennese or Swiss or Greek, for everyone it's pretty great to urinate. <laughs> Women are more circumspect, but men can piss with great effect, with terrible hydraulic force can make a stream or change its course, can put out fires or cigarettes, and sometimes laying down our bets, late at night outside the bars, we like to aim up at the stars. <laughs> oh yes, for men it's much more grand. Women sit or squat, we stand and hold the fellow in our hand and proudly watch the mighty arc, adjust the range and make our mark on stones and posts for rival men to smell and not come back again. <laughs> All right, enough of that. That's enough, enough. Enough for one night. Let me read a couple more and then if there are any urgent questions here in this fine audience we can take we can take those up. Katz's. From Times Square, the F train takes you to the Lower East Side, to East Houston and Delancey, to be satisfied at Katz's Deli. The name in red letters, K-A-T-Z, apostrophe S. A monument to fidelity in a maze of temporariness. All around are punk bars and hipster dives where Jews in tenements like beehives believed that if they were true to each other and the Lord, their children would reap a great reward. It is vanished, the land of Yiddish, and we Americans are skittish as water bugs, but Katz's for Republicans, socialists, anarchists, or Democrats is a beacon of corned beef and pastrami, as permanent as Leviticus or Deuteronomy, <laughs> and delicious knishes. The synagogue is a theater now, the whole street is a play. A man in a yellow skirt and leather boots in a doorway waits for someone, and next to him, teen girls stand and text. A dude with side-swept bangs and skinny tie hangs with a lady in leather with a face tattoo and lip ring, nuzzling and nickering, ten feet from Katz's delicatessen, which offers chicken soup and a lesson in true love and what true means, which is that one can feast on frankfurters and beans if the one who shares your booth is true to you, and that's the truth. Psalm. I probably wouldn't have put this in a book of poems um, 20 years ago, but then 
This didn't happen 20 years ago. So, so anyway, there it is. Psalm. Blessed is the man who does not sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, even through the 2012 presidential campaign. <laughs> Yea, though Barack Obama went blank during the first debate and let that gilded idiot Romney smarm and strut and puff, yet will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord God, yea, though the Gallup poll shows the race in a dead heat and Romney is full of crazed confidence and we must contemplate the return of Calvinist economics and smallpox and indentured servitude and stiffer sentences for stealing bread, yet will I praise thee, O Lord God. And though it is late October and my tongue bleeds from biting it when people whom I know personally say that maybe Romney can get the economy moving, yet I will attempt to praise the Lord for his goodness to me. Romney will be elected president and the White House will be full of grinning caucasoids who believe God has given them dominion over the earth. Have mercy upon me and answer me, O Lord. And the Lord hath shown mercy. Barack Obama won Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Virginia, Nevada, and Florida. And Mr. Romney came on TV stunned and tongue-tied. And the Koch brothers and Karl Rove were confounded and had to eat their underwear. <laughs> and Mr. Obama gave an elegant victory speech and we went to bed saying, thanks be to you, O Lord, your mercy endureth forever, amen. <laughs> Well, that's what happened, and that's, that's what happened at my house. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Let me read you this one since uh, we've just passed uh, the date. October 12. Song of October 12. Columbus sailed the ocean blue back in 1492. He sailed across and spotted land, a beach, and people on the sand. He called them Indians because he had no idea where he was. India was just a guess. When in doubt, declare success. <laughs> Calling this Columbus Day as if he'd found the USA, you may as well say you're Gershwin because you whistled Love Walked In or drop an apple and start tooting your horn as if you were Isaac Newton. Everybody knows the one who got here first was Leif Erikson. He sailed to Newfoundland and Cape Cod and did not come in the name of God to steal the gold and claim the land and evangelize the native band and kill them off with smallpox. He picked some apples, went for walks, traded knives for moccasins, sat down and wrote his sagas in Old Norse, and sailed to Oslo, and saw a friend and told him, yeah, so I just got back from way out west. And the friend said, oh yeah, I sort of guessed you were gone. Where'd you go? Oh, off to the New World, don't you know? He could have proclaimed the whole of America belonged to King Olaf, and instead he shrugged and said, hey, let October 12th be Columbus Day, whatever. I am totally okay with that. Hip, hip, hooray. And he continued seafaring back home for a plate of herring and a glass of beer to quench his thirst. He knew he got there first, or as Columbus might say, a priori. And as people heard the story, eventually life would get the glory. Well, I haven't really done a lyric here, so let me just do one lyric um, called Episcopalian. I'm slow to anger, don't covet or lust. No sins of pride, except sometimes I really must. Episcopalian, waiting around for you. 
The theology's easy, the liturgy too. Just stand up and kneel down and do as the others do. Episcopalian, saving myself for you. <laughs> At St. Michael's, we recycle. At St. Clemens, we suck lemons. Morning dawns on great white swans on the lawns of St. John's. There's white folks and black and gay and morose. Some male Anglo-Saxons, but we watch them pretty close. <laughs> Episcopalian, seven, my love for you. All right. Enough of that. Any questions from this uh, from this fine uh, assemblage of um, of people? I thought I saw a hand risen. No, no. Is oh, yes, yes, sir. What is your typical day like, or your typical week? What is my typical day like or week? Okay. Well, it depends on the on the time of week. Uh, early in the week or, or late in the week. Uh, I, I have a part-time job, and, I, and my job is on Saturday. And um, <laughs> so uh, Monday is pretty, pretty leisurely for me, you know. I, I uh, was, uh, uh, today I was um, working on, uh, working on a, a, a new book that comes out in, uh, in May, and, you know, with the feeling I have a lot of time. And... Um, Tomorrow, I'll probably do the same. Um, around Thursday, it starts to get a little more intense. And, uh, and so I start thinking about I start thinking about the show on, on Thursday because we have a, a rehearsal on Friday night. And so I, I should have written some guy noir or cowboys or English majors or something on Thursday, and then Friday I really have to, cause, <laughs> because the, um, the actors are going to be there at the, at the theater, and, um, and so I, I work out with the band, and I, and I, um, and I you know, go through some songs, uh, whatever I'm going to do, and then uh, the actors are there, and we go through whatever scripts I've, I've written, and um, Almost inevitably, everything just sounds really trashy to me. It just, you know, it's really discouraging. But you've, but you've heard it once, and, and, and that's helpful. And then from, from disaster, then you can rewrite on Friday night, complete rewrite. And, um, and so I send that by email to um, our, our script person, Ella, uh, in, the, in the morning, Saturday morning, and then I need to start thinking about uh, the news from Lake Wobegon. And, uh, and so that's a righteous uh, morning. Um, you know, I want, to, um, I want to make some notes and... Um, and, uh, and you, just, you, you, just, you just have to lock yourself in a room and just do it, you know, and, and force yourself to think. And, and there's some little opening that occurs to you, something that you remember from the week. Everything comes from the germ of, of, of actual uh, events, everything in fiction, I think. And, and from that, then you, then, you, then you can open the door uh, to, to a whole story. Um, and if you don't get a whole story, uh, you know, after all these years, you've learned to fake it. And, uh, <laughs> and you've learned to incorporate things that you did um, years ago will, will come back to you. you. In dire need, you can always go back and tell the story of the 25 Lutheran pastors on the pontoon boat. Um, 
And then, and then on Saturday, uh, you know, you go down to the theater and a lot of people there and it's very busy and you, you meet your guests and, you, and, you, and you, you, know, you work on all sorts of things, just nonstop. It's very lively and, and friendly and cheerful. And, uh, and when the show goes on the air, then that's when you have fun. The, the, the rest of it leading up to that is not that enjoyable necessarily. And, and then you do the show in this sort of exhilarated mood. And then after the show, uh, don't take it the wrong way, but after the show, um, there, there, is, um, there is this feeling of shame and, and humiliation. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was brought up for this, you know, I was... I was, uh, you know, brought up to uh, believe that man is inherently corrupt, and uh, and that and that nothing we do on our own is worthy in God's sight, and so, and so shame and humiliation follows, and and but it only lasts for a little while. Um, unfortunately, there are people around afterward uh, who want you to sign things, and they say, that was a wonderful show, that was terrific, you know, we love the show, and so, which makes you feel even more ashamed. Um, but, 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 then it's, but then it's over, and when it's over, it's completely over. You don't, you don't retain any memory, really, uh, of, of it. It just washes away. And Sunday, Sunday morning, uh, I get up, if I'm uh, back in St. Paul, I get up and uh, I go to my Episcopal church and... Uh, and, you know, I kneel down in this sort of narrow pew that was made for small people of the 19th century. And, uh, and I, you know, and I beg forgiveness for, you know, for what I have done and for what I have left undone. Uh, combination of both, really. And, uh, and then it's all, it's all gone. It's all gone. Short-term memory loss is really the secret of... Uh, <laughs> Of this of this line of work, and maybe and maybe other lines of work as well. You you don't want to hold these things. There is no staff meeting following the show at which we go over the show and critique it. A critique would kill me. It would just <laughs> it would lay me out. No, you just finish it and it's done. Yes, sir. Um, college. Well, I, I went to the university, big, big land grant university, but uh, but it was easy to find other people who were who were had literary ambitions, and and that was the great thing about a big school. You fell right in with them. Um, the English department at the university was probably the most uh, alcoholic English department in <laughs> America. I mean, they were sauced, you know. By, by early afternoon, they'd all had, had heavy martinis and scotch and sodas, and they were chain smokers, all of them. They smoked in the classroom. We had little tuna fish cans for ashtrays, and everybody, everybody smoked. It was required, you know. Um, so, you know, there was, there, was, there was that. You know, you picked up, you picked up a certain tinge of, of self-destructive behavior. But, um, but they were deeply, deeply in love with, with literature and with, and with words. This was before the, the politicization of, of the English department, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and before deconstruction. And uh, so, so it, was, um, it was a cheerful place. My first job uh, was at a radio station. It was a student radio station. Um, that broadcast closed circuit to the dormitories. And because I w had a crush on a girl who lived in the dormitory, that's what inspired me to go down and get a job at the student station. Um, I wanted to get the late night jazz uh, shift, but there was a cooler guy who got that. And, um, and what they gave me was the, was the 12 noon newscast, a 15 minute newscast, which I edited uh, myself from the Associated Press wire. And I sat in a little 
um, announced Booth, and, uh, and, I, and I did the news every day at 12 noon, 15 minutes, in a voice that I kind of took from CBS uh, radio, from, <coughs> from Edward R. Murrow and, uh, and Robert Trout, kind of a big you know, voice of time, uh, announcing voice. And uh, I did that from October, mid-October through uh, the end of May, when the engineers went out and did maintenance on the transmitters, which were in the basements of the dormitories. And they came back to report that whoever had done maintenance the summer before had neglected to turn the transmitters back on. <laughs> and, and so I had been sitting in a room reading the news to myself <laughs> out loud. And now I understood why she was not impressed. Uh, <laughs> Nowadays, you know, that would just kill you. It would just, it would just kill a person. But, but back then, you know, when you're, when you're 18 years old, you just bounce back. You just, you know, you go out and have a couple beers with some people, and, uh, and you're okay. That's how I started out in radio, by, by talking to myself. Yes, sir. I think I am, but I think um, I, th I think that um, a person a person loves music that you hear at a certain stage in your life, and and your tastes kind of stay fixed there, and 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 so um, my taste in country music is uh, is is back I don't know back in the seventies somewhere. Um, I thought that I thought that whenever Dolly and Porter sang duets, that that was sort of the epitome of something. And uh, and I liked some of those old songwriters. I loved uh, Waylon Jennings. Uh, um, but 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 I think today's music. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. I think a lot of the performers. I think a lot of the more traditional. Ones, Emmy Lou Harris. I think Vince Gill is just one of the greatest people I ever met in my life. Um, and um, but bluegrass, yeah, yeah. But 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 not necessarily the kind that uh, you know the kind that I hear on the on the radio. It's really family band music, and uh, I like these these uh, family bluegrass bands that do a lot of gospel and and. Uh, have a sense of relatedness about them. I have odd taste. Yes, sir. How do you teach uh, creativity is the, uh, is the question. I don't think that I would, really. I think that uh, creativity is something that sort of bubbles up inside people, and they have some need to, to, uh, to invent. And who knows where that need comes from. But if somebody, if somebody comes to me and wants to write, uh, I tell them, as I told my classes, my writing classes, uh, that I've, that I've taught, I, I tell young people uh, to go talk to your parents and uh, go talk to your grandparents if you're lucky enough to still have them around and uh, look into your own family history, which has been uh, hidden from you. Believe me, you have not been told. <laughs> and uh, you will have to be persistent to, uh, to, to gather this uh, information. You really have to be persevere and, and uh, at first they will be flattered that you ask and then they will be alarmed. But, uh, <laughs> but, to, but to learn your own family's history and find out where you come from is a creative act. 
um, they created you, and uh, and then for you to go back and to and to find out what were the circumstances. What year were you born? Eighty five, nineteen eighty five. A lot was going on in nineteen eighty five, and with them too. So, <laughs> so what was uh, what was the story there? Where are you in your family? Where am I? Yeah. You're the second oldest, and how many follow you? I have three younger than Aha, so you are a middle child. You are the second of five. Aha. Uh-huh. You look like a middle child. <laughs> that well-behaved, quiet, polite, good middle child that nobody notices. They, <laughs> the indivisible middle child. No, I think there's a whole, there's a whole story there for you. And uh, and I think if you and I think if you can find it, I think that it would be a it would be a start. But you know what? Whatever happens later happens. Uh, yes. The concept. Well, it started here in Nashville. It. Uh, I came down here in, uh, in the spring, the early spring of 1974, 15 years before he was born. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I came down uh, because the Opry, the Grand Ole Opry was moving from the Ryman out to Opryland. And uh, Richard M. Nixon was coming down for the first performance at Opryland. He was in very serious trouble uh, he was just a few months away from resignation, and uh, he wanted to be, appear before a friendly audience, so he came down. And so the New Yorker magazine thought it was worth my while to come down and, and write about it. In the end, I didn't, wasn't interested in writing about uh, President Nixon um, and, and his um, appearance, I, but I, I wanted to write about the Opry. And these interesting old timers who were who were backstage at the Opry, Sid Hark Reader and and Minnie Pearl, of course, and and all these others who are now long gone, and um, and Sam and Kirk McGee from Sunny Tennessee, and the Fruit Jar Drinkers and uh, all these other bands. So that's what I did, and, and as I stood backstage at the at the Ryman. Uh, I thought, you know, a person could do this. You could, you could do this. You could have a, a live radio variety show. I would have more comedy than, than the Opry did, but a live variety show, and you could do this with other kinds of music and do it up in, up in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. So I did. Back in the early days of public radio, before it began to be so organized, you know, and, and when stations were just small bunch of amateurs uh, before they brought in all of these vice presidents and, uh, and, uh, and uh, project managers and, uh, and before people in public radio uh, started using words like proactive. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was easy to, easy to just start up something and Nobody would tell you you couldn't do it. Yes, in the back. I grew up in Minnesota and I uh-huh. love your show and all the characters on there to me are somebody I know. Uh-huh. <laughs> Which of the characters on your show is closest to a real person that you know? Based on a real, real person. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, um, I think they're related to my uh, aunts and uncles who um, who are all gone now. That whole generation is completely gone, and um, and so I think more and more those characters take on the characteristics of my deceased relatives. Um, it's a, it's an odd thing. It didn't used to be that way. Um, they used to more closely resemble uh, people who were. Neighbors of mine, when I lived on a farm in Freeport, Minnesota, among German Catholics, and uh, and and Lake Wobegon was based on the small towns in around Stearns County, and 
uh, on Avon and, and uh, Albany and Holdingford and so forth. Um, but now they seem to be swinging towards uh, Aunt Josephine and, uh, and Uncle Lawrence and Aunt Ruth and people I, people I knew. The characters, uh, the adults in Lake Wobegon never get any older. I don't know why. The children do, and the children age, and, uh, and the children uh, grow up, and they, and they move away, and, uh, and the adults stay, stay the same. And it's been now 40 years, and, uh, and they're still as they, as they were. I've frozen them in ice. <laughs> yes, sir. How do I find myself? How do you quiet yourself? Oh, oh. I didn't think it was a problem. Um, <laughs> I think it's just basically fear, you know, fear of, <laughs> fear of uh, humiliating yourself. And, uh, and uh, I, I just never, I never wanted to be a fool in, in public. I was, I was brought up with a very high sense of decorum. And uh, so I'm sort of suited to the radio uh, in, in, in a way. Um, I've never um, found it possible to, to uh, be obscene on, on the radio. No, it's, just, it's never been a problem. I mean, writer's block is, is, is for it's for other people. It's for people who are more ambitious than I am, you see. <laughs> Writer's block is a, is, a, is a sign that you're trying to do something you can't do. And I respect that, but I don't do it myself, you see. <laughs> I, don't, I don't follow that, that, that way of life. I, I am one of the few writers uh, you will meet um, who will admit to you that I do this for fun. And uh, I don't suffer over it. I haven't, I haven't suffered over it, I think, I don't know, since I was in my 20s when, you know, when I, when I thought suffering was part of the deal. <laughs> I'm sorry, yes, 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 sir. You have amazing insight into church people. Where's, where's your insight into church people come from? Well, church people are just like any other people. I mean, that's uh, that's uh, thing you have to thing you have to realize. Um, you know, the gospel is for sinners, and those are the people who come to church. And uh, and the saints, I don't know where they go, somewhere, but uh, you know, they're they're off somewhere. They're off somewhere else. No, no. There's just there's a lot of human nature in everybody. Uh, including, including church people. If you if you are a perfectionist, you know if you demanded perfection, uh, which I don't think God does, um, you know you should go into calligraphy or go into uh, <laughs> mechanical engineering. Uh, but you don't. You wouldn't want to go into church work. It's, it would drive you drive you berserk. If it has no, yes. The role of. I know why. Guy Noir. Guy Noir was um, a, a way of being able to uh, say things that you that you couldn't ordinarily say uh, on public radio. And uh, Guy Noir is a great admirer of, uh, of women. And, uh, you know, she was tall. She was tall. She was blonde. Her hair was the color God had in mind when he said, let there be hair. <laughs> I stood next to her, and I felt privileged just to inhale air she had recently exhaled. 
Her jeans were so tight, I could read the embroidery on her underwear. <laughs> it said, Tuesday. <laughs> and today was only Monday, so I figured there was time. She wore a Mount Rushmore T-shirt. And let me tell you, <laughs> Lincoln and Jefferson never looked so good. <laughs> it's like that. It's like that. Just, you know. <laughs> Rough talk. All right? Thank you so much for coming.